Mesopotamian irrigation was of the basin type, like that of the Egyptian delta. As such, basins do not have mechanical gates or sluices. They are opened by digging a gap in the surrounding embankment and closed by shoveling mud into this gap again. Hence, Mesopotamian irrigation farming was a very laborious business. A main form of engineering advance is the substitution of continuous for intermittent motion and the rotary and rotary motion for back and forth motion. The Mesopotamians attained this stage about 1200 BC. A legal document on clay orders a man to replace a water raising tread wheel 20 feet long with 17 steps which he had borrowed and lost. Interesting. I wonder how he lost that misplaced. He was looking around his house and he couldn't find it. Mesopotamian laws not only required farmers to keep their basins and feeder canals in repair, but also called upon everyone in the kingdom to turn out with a hoe and shovel in times of flood, or when a new canal had to be dug, or an old one repaired. Times of trouble caused the canal system to decay so that, the, so that extra effort was required to put it back into good condition. With the best of care, however, canals would last only about a thousand years. Now that is a pretty long time. Really, really well cared for canals last about a thousand years. <clears throat> then they were abandoned and others were built. Today, four or five thousand years later, Iraq is still ridged with the embankments of these abandoned canals crisscrossing the country in parallel lines. Uh, four thousand, you might see that on Google Earth. For, for four thousand years the Mesopotamian canal system supported a denser population than lives there today as of the 1960s. Then in 1258 the Mongols of Haluga Khan conquered Mesopotamia sacked Baghdad and killed the last of the caliphs of Baghdad. Looking upon all sedentary peoples as vermin to be wiped out, the Mongols destroyed the irrigation system and allowed a famine to reduce the population to a fraction of its former size. Iraq remained under Mongol rule for about a century. As nothing was done to rebuild the canals, the land went back to desert and swamp. Subsequently plundered by Arabs, Turks, and Kurds, the region was almost depopulated, as happened to many other lands in ancient times, as the result of barbarian raids and conquests. However, the ruin of Mesopotamian irrigation may not have been due solely to the Mongols. There is reason to think that agriculture in this region had been decaying for centuries before the Mongol invasion. The reason for this decay has to do with salt. In the lower strata of the alluvial soil of Mesopotamia lie thick beds of salt. This salt may be a relic of a prehistoric time when the sea covered the whole Euphratean plain. When such a soil is irrigated again and again for thousands of years, capillary action draws salt water to the surface. As the water evaporates, the salt remains and little by little makes the land useless for farming. So, perhaps even with modern agricultural methods, Iraq will never again be the teeming farmland that it was in ancient times. We skip away. The first temples of Mesopotamia were built in the 4th millennium BC with starkly rectang rectangular lines. They had blank brick outer walls pierced high by a few small triangular windows. Later Mesopotamian temples were brightly decorated. This was done by pressing cones of collared brick about the size of a finger into the wet plaster that covered the walls and pillars so that only the bases of the cone could be seen. The walls and pillars of the temples of Uruk and Aquair, a -U -Q -A -I -R, were gay with mosaics formed by these cones placed in gaudy patterns of colored polka dots. Even richer effects were obtained by affixing wafers of copper plating or a colored stone to the bases of the cones. To make them more impressive, temples were sometimes raised upon a pyramidal, or pyramidal platform of brick. These pyramids became larger and larger until two distinct types of sacred structure evolved. The first was the temple proper, a massive pillared hall on the ground. The other was a ziggurat, Z-I-G-G-U-R-A-T a lofty pyramid of brick with setbacks, staircases, and a shrine on the top. The only ziggurat that still survives in anything like its original form 
stands at Ur in the south. You are amid what is now a desolate wilderness. There are several theories about the purpose of ziggurats. The theory that most persuades me is that these towers were used like the Palestinian high places mentioned in the Bible or the large wooden pillars on the grounds of Syrian temples. In Syria, a priest would climb to the top of such a pillar. Another priest at the foot of the pillar collected offerings from the faithful as they asked him questions. Now, it, it's one thing to... I mean, we're amazed by the height of our buildings that we built today. and uh, You know, in France, they were obsessed with the height of their cathedrals. But back in ancient Mesopotamia, when you live on a broad, flat plain with no mountains or hills at all, uh, you know, any structure that goes up above the plain is, is amazing. But, continuing, the priest at the foot of the pillar collected offerings from the faithful as they asked him questions. This priest shouted each question up to the priest on the pillar, who in turn shouted it up to the gods. The pillar brought the petitioning priest nearer to heaven, so that the gods could hear him more plainly. So, I suspect that ziggurats likewise furnished Mesopotamian priests with an elevated platform whence to address the powers above with the needed audibility. The most famous ziggurat was raised at Babylon in honor of Marduk, the Babylonian Jupiter. You know, Jupiter was the most powerful of all Roman gods. The Bible calls the ziggurat the Tower of Babel. To the Babylonians, it was E-T-E-M-E-N-A-N-K-I. Etemenaki, Etemenanki, the cornerstone of the universe. The Tower of Babel was the cornerstone of the universe. Originally built by the gods themselves, after several destructions and rebuildings, it reached its final form under Nebuchadnezzar II around 600 BC. At that point it towered skyward for nearly 300 feet and was covered with enameled bricks in colored patterns. Could the legend of the confusion of tongues be an echo of labor troubles during the building of Etemenanki? Etemenanki? It is a tempting speculation, but alas, no evidence supports it. Now, I don't know if he's read the things I've read about uh, the Assyrians and the Babylonians taking whole cities and relocating them and using them as labor and stuff, and, uh, you know, an empire that's trying to build something like the pyramids or the Great Wall or the Tower of Babel might, in conquests, try really hard to bring slaves back from any place that could gather them. That is, that seems to me, a pretty good explanation of the myth of all these people who were trying to build this tower and there was problems because of their language difficulties, you know. That seems like a pr it's much more likely than that God just all of a sudden zapped it and nobody there on the building site spoke the same language as anybody else. That's not very likely. The seeming similarity of Mesopotamian ziggurats to Egyptian pyramids, and for that matter to the pyramids of Central America, you know, some people say obviously UFOs went everywhere and taught everybody how to build these things. And the question is put, how could they all have come up with this same shape unless they were in contact. So, he says, uh, the shape of all these being so similar is explained by the state of engineering in these lands when these structures were made. If you set out to build an edifice several hundred feet high, when architecture is in its infancy, the arch and the vault are practically unknown, and metal reinforcement is undreamed of you have to adopt a pyramidal form for the sake of stability. It's just, there's no other option. None. Uh, in the 12th century BC, this teeming farmland with its web of blue canals and its looming ziggurats resounded to the tramp of the dreaded soldiery of Assyria. Burly, bearded, hook-nosed men with heavy boots and crested bronze and helms. For 500 years, one of the most ferociously militaristic governments known to history held the land between the rivers in its merciless grip. Assyrian kings were always putting up monuments, boasting, and here's a translation, I destroyed them, tore down the wall, and burned the town with fire. I caught the survivors and impaled them on stakes in front of their towns. Pillars 